Uh, how many of you have purchased from Zappos before? For the camera. <laughs> Um, and so normally the ratio is about two to one women to men, and a lot of guys I ask actually say they haven't personally bought from us, but a lot of times their wives or significant others have in, in, in on their behalf. And so I was giving a tour a few years ago to an executive from one of the major record labels, and we actually offered tours to the public, uh, and, and so would encourage you guys to come take a tour if you have time this trip or, or next time you're in town. Uh, we actually just finished relocating our headquarters from Henderson, which is a suburb of uh, Vegas, to the former city hall. And uh, I'll show some pictures of that in a little bit. But, um, but anyways, th this was back when we were in Henderson. Uh, at the time, we were spread amongst three different buildings. And I was walking through the ground floor of the building that I worked out of, which is where our merchandising team was. And I asked him the same question, had he bought from us before? And he said he hadn't personally bought from us, but suspected his wife had, because it, it, these white boxes would show up on his doorstep, and, uh, and then they just disappear, and he'd have no idea what was going on. Uh, he didn't know if she was exchanging them, returning them, buying new shoes. And every time he asked her, she would just flat out refuse to answer him and change the subject. So we go upstairs to our uh, customer loyalty team, which is our name for our call center, and there's this whiteboard there that you'll see that lists the different stats, like number of phone calls we took through the call center yesterday, uh, percent of phone calls we answered in 20 seconds or less, sales through the call center, and so on. And as I'm going through these stats, I turn around, and he's disappeared. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. So I go looking for him. And finally, I find him. Turns out he had gone halfway down one of our aisles, sat down next to one of our customer service reps, and forced her to pull up his wife's account. And he discovered that she had spent over $62,000 in her lifetime. So hopefully we weren't instrumental to any divorce proceedings or anything like that. Um, oh, I also wanted to mention uh, we're doing this team uh, uh, activity to support uh, Movember, uh, which is this charity thing at Zappos. So this is actually the longest I've ever had, a, had a, any type of mustache. Prior to that, that was... Uh, the mustache that I had. Um, and so I wanted to uh, in first backtrack a little bit. From, from the Zappos perspective, the way we thought of our brand uh, when the book came out a few years ago was in terms of the three C's, clothing, customer service, and company Hi. culture. Um, and, and so one of my favorite quotes, I think it was from an executive from one of the major ad agencies, is a great brand is a story that never stops unfolding. And when the book came out a few years ago, people said, okay, great delivering happiness, what's next? And actually, for the longest time, we didn't have a great answer to that. Uh, this is our Henderson headquarters, and uh, a few, it was just a few years ago that we announced that we were moving into the former Las Vegas City Hall in, in downtown Vegas. But we had actually been looking for a place to uh, build a permanent campus for at least the past seven or eight years. And then finally we found out the city was building a new city hall, and so we were super excited about this opportunity to move into the former city hall. And we actually just had our rib ribbon cutting. We set a new world record. Uh, it was a mile-long ribbon with um, the most number of people simultaneously cutting a ribbon. It was over 1,500 people. And then uh, we had a happy hour afterwards, and someone decided that was a good idea to have 1,500 pairs of scissors and alcohol. Um, <laughs> And so, but backtrack two or three years, once we found out the city hall opportunity was available, uh, we got super excited and, and we asked employees for ideas and suggestions, what should we have in our dream campus? And I toured campuses like Nike and Google and Apple. Uh, these, uh, oh, this Apple one isn't showing up, but uh, amazing campuses. And, uh, and we actually surveyed our uh, employees, and, and I remember actually Nike has, when I toured there, they had this running track around one of their buildings, and uh, in another one of their buildings, they had a uh, on-site pub, and we thought to ourselves, we need one of those, and so, uh, and so we, those were incorporated into the suggestions, and, uh, and as employees sent us, our, we literally got hundreds and hundreds of requests, like on-site gym and on-site pub, and and so on. But the number one request we got from employees was actually doggy daycare. More than human daycare. And so, and so as we started thinking about it more, we re realized a couple things. One is that we couldn't possibly fit 
all of those uh, different amenities under one roof. And the other thing we realized was those other campuses, Apple, Nike, Google, were great for employees, but were actually kind of insular and didn't really integrate or contribute to the community around them. And so we thought to ourselves, well, what if actually we turned the entire concept inside out? What if we took an approach that was more analogous to NYU, where the campus kind of blends in with the city, you don't really know where one begins and the other ends, and we're actually encouraging employees to go out into the community and people in the community to come onto the campus and, and have those interactions. And so uh, by pure coincidence, this was also roughly about three years ago, a bunch of Zappos employees, myself included, had started discovering this area that most tourists don't know about called Fremont East, and I, and I didn't even know about it at, at the time, and I'd been living in Vegas for seven years, uh, and, and, uh, three years ago. And so, uh, and in this, most tourists, when they think about Vegas, think of the casinos on the Strip, which technically, as it turns out, we're not even in the city of Las Vegas right now, or if they know anything about downtown, it's the old casinos, the overhead light show, and so on. But turns out, uh, you know, all of that stuff downtown is on the west side of Las Vegas Boulevard. If you go on to the east side, there's actually an area called Fremont East that is, if anything, the complete opposite of what people typically associate with Vegas. And there's no gaming. If you go into any of these bars or restaurants or coffee shops, you would have no idea you're, you're in Vegas. And it's actually the most community-focused place I've ever lived. And I uh, grew up in San Francisco, but I've never lived in a place where the bar owners hang out in each other's bars just to help support each other. And so for us, we, that actually led us to our answer for, okay, what's next for the Zappos brand? How does a brand continue to unfold? And we went from having these three C's of clothing, customer service, and company culture to adding a fourth C, and the fourth C being community, and trying to weave everything that we do to incorporate all of these things. So for example, uh, we, ha we held a skateboarding event and had professional skaters, and that we invited the community to come, so it was a fun event, but then it was also a great opportunity for our employees to bond with each other, and that helps build company culture. We captured some of that content on video, live streamed it, and, uh, and then for customers that are interested in buying skate shoes, now we can weave in uh, the story of skate shoes and our company culture and what we're doing with the community into the Zappos story and the Zappos brand. So that's kind of the Zappos side of it. Um, now I'm gonna switch gears. Uh, there's actually a separate company called Downtown Project that is just privately funded by myself and a couple other friends, no outside investors, and that really allows us to take a long-term approach and, uh, and, and really think about what's actually best for the community 10 years from now. And there's a few different goals. One is to help create a place where you have everything you need to live, work, play within walking distance. Another is to help make downtown Vegas the most community-focused large city in the world and probably the place people least expect it. And third is to make it the co-working and co-learning capital of the world, and not just for tech startups, but also in fashion and culinary and uh, 3D printing. And, and you can really imagine building community around, around building co-working spaces around anything that you can build a community around. And what makes us different from other real estate developers or urban revitalization projects is rather than focus on the short or medium term ROI or cash flow needs, uh, we actually focus more on maximizing the long term ROC, return on community. And, uh, and then we also have this concept of really thinking about how do we institutionalize ROL, which is this acronym I stole from Jim Collins' latest book, Great by Choice, uh, Return on Luck. And, uh, let me just return on luck. And, and how do you actually, which sounds like a strange thing, how can you actually um, manage luck? How do you make a community luckier? Uh, and how do you actually accelerate serendipity? But we actually have uh, very real metrics and, and ways that we go about doing this, and I'll share some of those in a little bit. And so the big bet is for downtown projects, focusing on these three Cs, collisions, community, and co-learning. And by collisions, meaning uh, people in the community running into each other serendipitously. Uh, and the reason why that's important is because the research has shown most innovation actually comes from something outside your industry being applied to your own. And so by focusing on these three Cs, collisions, community, and coloring, that not only will that lead to a happier and luckier community, but actually innovation and productivity increases. And so I'll give a quick breakdown of, of the budget. Uh, 50 million we're investing into small businesses to help build a sense of neighborhood and community. And so we actually have a downtown project tour as well that goes through my apartment. And this, this is actually the post-it note uh, wall on my apartment. And 
we're very actually anti-top-down master planning. Uh, instead, we want everything to be organic. And so when people come through on the tour, we just ask them, what do you want in your dream neighborhood? And if it's not already on the wall, we encourage them to write it down and put, a, put their own post-it on the wall. But the other cool thing is every once in a while, we get someone whose lifelong dream is to say, retire 10 years from now and start a cupcake bakery. And we said, well, rather than wait 10 years, why don't you just, uh, why don't we invest in you and you can start living your dream now and that'll actually help build the sense of neighborhood and community too. So we have a few different criteria uh, and, and they're all important. Unique versus best is really important, but probably the most important one is the, it needs to help build community and the entrepreneurs and the business needs to care more about just themselves or their business. They need to want to help contribute to the community and help other entrepreneurs in the community. So it's kind of analogous to how we hire at Zappos, where we do a separate set of interviews purely for culture fit, and they have to pass that culture test in order to be hired. Uh, here, in, order, in addition to making sense as a small business investment or as a tech investment, there's also an evaluation as to whether they're actually a company or an entrepreneur that cares about contributing to the community. And so this is Natalie, and she had worked, I actually uh, serendipitously ran into her at the local coffee shop, uh, I think a year and a half ago. And it turns out that she had worked for the past 10 years as a chef at one of the major casinos, and had just quit her job because she was sick of working in a casino environment. And she was actually packing up her bags to head back home to Santa Fe. And as we started talking, found out that her lifelong dream was to open up her own breakfast and lunch place. And so she, it turns out she actually ended up being one of the first small businesses that, uh, that we funded. And you can see this under uh, construction. Um, oh, and I'm not normally a power, I'm not really a PowerPoint person, but I'm very proud of this transition. So we'll <laughs> watch it again. Thank you. So, so you can see it under construction, and then she just had her one-year anniversary, is doing triple her initial projections, and uh, <laughs> you know, living her dreams, and, uh, and also it's become this new daytime hub for the community, where if you go have a breakfast or lunch there, during that hour, you'll probably run, in, it's normal to run into five or 10 people uh, serendipitously. This is, a, last year this was still a check hashing place. This is what it looked like on the inside. And Sarah's lifelong dream was to open up her own boutique clothing store. And so she describes it now as a hangout place that happens to sell clothing. And people in the community will stop by several times a day just to say hi or go work on their laptops in the back or, or, or just to hang out. Uh, pretty excited, in a week and a half, we're actually opening up, I think it's the world's largest shipping container park. Uh, made out of uh, reused shipping containers. And I'll show some renderings. And, and actually, this guy here is a guy named Ernie, who used to be a Zappos employee. And then he actually quit several years ago because his passion in life was all about barbecuing. And so he started making his own barbecue sauce and cooking his own meat and going to farmers markets and, and selling those. And then we actually decided to invest in him. And that's, I happened to be walking by on the street and that's literally his restaurant being lowered behind him. And he was super happy uh, into the container park. And so uh, it's gonna have nighttime and daytime activation. That's actually a 40 foot praying mantis from Burning Man that shoots out 20 foot flames. And, uh, and there'll be 40 different retail shops. And it's a little hard to see, but uh, up on top, uh, there's actually an outdoor live music stage. And so the idea is in the middle, we're building this kid's paradise that will have a 25 foot tall Swiss Family Robinson type of tree house, these giant Lego blocks and so on, and make it such a fun place for kids, but the parents can actually hang out with other adults knowing their kids are safe and enjoy the live music, enjoy their wine and cheese and, and so on. Um, and so, I don't know why some of these photos aren't showing up, but there's a picture of a bike here that's pretty cool. And, uh, and, and so one of our, one of our uh, goals is actually to get people to get rid of their cars. So we're actually investing in bike sharing. And we announced a few months ago, we placed the largest order in the United States of Teslas. We ordered 100 Teslas, and that'll be part of the, our bike sharing program. And we're also adding other electric vehicles to that as well. Um, we're investing 50 million into tech startups, and in the past year, we've relocated 60 tech startups from other states or, or even other countries. We just had a 20-person 
team uh, from China that was on their way to Sil Silicon Valley and then decided actually after two days in Vegas to move their company here instead. And we asked these startups, why are you moving here? And they say it's for two reasons. One is really for the sense of community that is very real here in, in, uh, in much more so than any other place I, I've lived. And, uh, and then the other reason is really this whole idea of thinking of the city as a startup. And how many opportunities do you have in a lifetime to help shape the future of a major city? We're partnering with Venture for America, which is like Teach for America, but for college graduates that want to become entrepreneurs. Uh, partnering with Teach for America, actually they're in the process of relocating their Vegas headquarters to downtown, so that'll bring that additional uh, energy to the area. Uh, and over here there was a picture of uh, oh, an early childhood center uh, that we opened up a couple months ago. Uh, actually initially six weeks through kindergarten, but every year we're going to add a couple grades, so it'll eventually include K through 12. That's teaching kids uh, entrepreneurship and creativity using the latest Science, neuroscience research, and uh, took over an arts and music festival called First Friday. It's on the first Friday of every month, draws 25 to 30,000 people, and also partnered with the founders of Burning Man to bring large-scale art to downtown Vegas. And so this is actually 45 feet tall, and you can, I think, crawl up there and put a DJ on top. And, and so the idea is every block or so just have uh, some fire element or some large scale element to get people to just walk one more block and then walk one more block and walk one more block. And, and this is a Mexican restaurant that was opened uh, back, in, back in May. So uh, a couple weekends ago, we actually hosted, uh, we had the first Life is Beautiful festival, which was actually four festivals in one. It was a music festival, there were 65 bands, uh, culinary festival, 50 celebrity chefs, and also an arts festival and a learning festival. And we fenced off 15 city blocks, which has never been done before in, in any city. And, um, and, and so it's almost like South by Southwest meets Coachella. And so this is the f rough footprint of what it looked like. And here's a shot. And I actually wanted to play a video. And, um, and just to introduce the video, uh, this video was actually came out in June when we were announcing which bands and chefs were going to be at the Life is Beautiful Festival. Uh, and this video was actually put together by Downtown Films, which is one of the other small businesses that we decided to invest in from Downtown Projects. So we're really trying to keep the money local and, 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 uh, and have uh, as many local businesses uh, involved in everything that we do. So let's go ahead. So uh, thank you. So, so we were uh, super happy with, with how that turned out, got lucky with the weather, and, uh, and I think the initial estimates are that we had 60,000 people over two days come. But the cool part was people got to come and they actually got to, uh, for a lot, most of them actually, I think it was their first exposure to downtown, and they, were, they would walk into a coffee shop and there'd be someone playing guitar, and, and that's actually just how the coffee shop normally is, and, and so it wasn't this temporary setup just for, just for festivals. So, uh, pretty excited. We also got local chefs and uh, and and local musicians uh, to play at, at the festival as well. So, um, can we go back to the PowerPoint, please? And um, uh, there's, while they're loading up the PowerPoint, uh, there's another book I would there's a book I would recommend called uh, Triumph of the City. Uh, it's written by a Harvard economics professor he, that studied cities from all different time periods: Rome, New York, Detroit, and looked at why some thrived and some didn't. And a lot of the uh, findings are actually really counterintuitive, but they've been guiding a lot of the things that we've been doing on the downtown project side. And one of the most interesting findings is that uh, every time the size of a city doubles, productivity or innovation per resident increases by 15%. But when companies get bigger, the opposite happens. Productivity and innovation per employee starts going down. And so one of the reasons why we're interested in the city revitalization stuff from the Zappos perspective is really thinking about how do we avoid that fate at Zappos? And how do we make Zappos organize more like a city and less like a big corporation? And the ingredients for that to happen in a city are you need a residential density of 100 residents per acre combined with street level activity, so all those post-it notes that you saw for the collisions to happen. And the third ingredient is I think probably the hardest, but also the cheapest and the one that gives you the most leverage, this culture of openness, collaboration, and sharing. So if people are twice as likely to talk to each other, 
then maybe you only need half that residential density. And uh, there, it turns out that there's a lot of stuff that we've been doing over the past 14 years at Zappos in terms of thinking about how do we get employees to collide in an office environment that actually translates somewhat to really thinking about how to get people in the community to collide in a city environment. We think a lot about office density uh, at Zappos. So average office density in the US is two or 300 square feet of office space per employee. And at our new city hall headquarters, we're actually at less than 100 square feet per employee. And the reason why we care so much about that is because the research has shown that if you sit twice as far away from someone in an office environment, you don't see them half as often. You see them half as often squared, so a quarter as, a, as often. And so we actually prioritize collisions over convenience. So uh, it's off the screen, but on the left side is the parking garage where the city employees used to park. And then after parking, they go through the sky bridge and then directly into their former city hall. Well, we actually shut down that sky bridge for our employees so that after they park, they have to go out and into the city, onto the streets, and then go around to the central plaza in order to have more collision opportunities with, with the community and with each other. And so the big bet is by, and this is just a partial list now, have, by having all these different diverse, creative, entrepreneurial type of groups together, put them in, together in a relatively small space, and statistically, the magic will just kind of happen on its own. One of the things we realize is that culture is to a company as community is to a city. It's the same concept, just at a different scale. So this is actually the building that I live in. It's called the Ogden. There's 500 bedrooms in there, and collectively, our group is leasing about half of them. And of those, there's 100 bedrooms that we've set up as furnished apartments, essentially free hotel rooms. And so uh, anytime we meet someone interesting, we, we just say, hey, next time you're in Vegas, come stay with us in one of our furnished apartments. And what ends up happening is they're essentially tricked into going to the local coffee shop and the local bars and, and restaurants. And they discover a whole other side of Vegas. And so right now, we're hosting about 100 people a week. And, uh, and, and so when people come, we basically look through the list and pick 15 or 20 of them and ask them, hey, as long as you're in town, do you want to give a short talk about something to the community uh, about whatever you're passionate about or, or working on? And 95% of them end up saying yes. And so uh, there's this ongoing free content now for, for the community. And so when you go to a conference like this conference or TED, uh, there's two reasons to go. One is for the content for the different speakers, and the other reason is just for the serendipitous encounters that, of people that you're gonna run into. And what downtown Vegas is starting to become is it's almost like we're throwing a mini TED conference every single week now. And so on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Fremont Street, the most prominent intersection of all of Las Vegas, we acquired a building, and instead of turning it into a bar or an easy money maker like a McDonald's, we actually are building a speaker's theater called the Inspire Theater. And this is actually due to open up next month. And uh, so imagine if Wednesday afternoon through Sunday afternoon, anyone can walk in and there's someone giving a free talk about, about something. And, uh, and there's also, we're, it'll have Vegas's largest magazine uh, selection and also co lots of co-working and collaboration spaces as well as a uh, rooftop bar. And so um, we, we've actually started theming each of the different weeks now. So first week of every month is arts and music focus. Second week is a tech focus week. Third is fashion focus. And fourth we call Catalyst Week. And it's almost like a younger version of TED. Uh, and a lot of social entrepreneurs come, come to that. This is actually a stitch factory, a fashion incubator that, that we opened up. And, um, and so when we first started this, we thought we needed to invest a lot into residential. And I started thinking, OK, what is actually the value of resident, of resident of, say, someone like me. And start doing the math on that. And I'm uh, out and about in a collisionable way, meaning I might serendipitously run into someone. It could be in, on the sidewalk or in a restaurant and so on, three or four hours a day times seven days a week. I travel a lot, so call it 40 weeks a year. If you do the math, it works out to about 1,000 collisionable hours a year. And, uh, and then there's a guy named Jake that we met that actually uh, had the most successful Kickstarter campaign in the fashion category. He recently raised over a million dollars on Kickstarter just selling these hoodies that last for 10 years. And we told him, oh, you should definitely move to Vegas. He, and he lives in New York. And for various reasons, he couldn't. But uh, he heard about our fashion focus weeks and basically agreed to come out 
once a month for that fashion focus week and give talks to, and he's actually given several talks. One of them was about how to actually have a really good Kickstarter campaign or how to create a good Kickstarter video and, and mentored other entrepreneurs and had office hours and so on. And so start doing the math on someone like Jake. What is the value of a purposeful visitor? And when he's here, he's out in about 12 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 times a year. It actually works out to be about 1,000 collegial hours a year as well. And so while we still want people to move to downtown Vegas, we actually now have this additional option that can still help us accelerate everything we're trying to do in the community. And we've been calling that subscribing to downtown Vegas. And so we basically changed our formula. Instead of focusing on 100 residents per acre, instead we're focusing on 100,000 collegial community hours per acre per year, which works out to 2.3 collegial hours per square foot per year, which basically just gives you a whole new way of thinking about real estate. So if we're investing in a small business, we can really think about the number of customers, the number, amount of time they'll spend there, and, and whether that's yielding uh, enough collegial hours. And so our big bet is by focusing on these three Cs, uh, you know, a lot of urban revitalization projects depend on having an expensive sports team or stadium or a Harvard or Stanford. But we wanted the three C's, to, collisions, community, and co-learning, to be something that could be replicated to other communities and, and other cities. And what we want people to say about downtown, by us focusing on these three C's, is whether they're just visiting or uh, subscribing or living there, is that downtown Vegas will make you smarter which is probably the last thing that a lot of people would have associated with, with Vegas or, or downtown. So um, there's a common theme of inspiration that we try to weave through uh, Zappos and Delivering Happiness, which is a separate company spun off of the book and Downtown Project. And um, I, don't, I don't know how many people in this room know this, but uh, this just happened in the past few years. For the first time in human history, 50% of all humans now live in cities. And within our lifetime, that's actually going to jump up to 75%. And so I view what we're doing as much more than just about downtown Vegas or, or even the Vegas area in general. You know, and our hope is that uh, it's kind of analogous to the story of the four-minute mile, where for the longest time, people thought it was impossible to run a mile in under four minutes. And then in 1954, this guy named Roger, Rogers Bannister broke the four-minute mile. And what I found interesting is that in less than a year, in less than a year, other people broke the four-minute mile. And it wasn't that nutrition was better on Earth that year. It's just that people believed it was possible. So if we can make downtown Vegas a place of inspiration and entrepreneurial energy, creativity, innovation, upward mobility, and all that good stuff, uh, using the three C's, collisions, community, co-learning, hopefully that can help inspire other communities and cities to reinvent themselves as well. And we can be the four minute mile for the world. So I just want to end on the quote, uh, great brand is a story that never stops unfolding. I think the same is true for a company, same is true for a city, and same is true for a community. And that's why I'm so excited to be a resident of downtown Las Vegas right now, because I can't wait to see what unfolds next. Thank you very much.